Okay. So we are recording. So as I was saying, um, our goal today is dynamic time warping. This is an algorithm that's pretty popular. And we are uh, going to look at this algorithm and that's about it. This is a short class. I, I expect it to finish in half an hour, 40 minutes and you're free to go. Okay, any other questions uh, before I get started? I think what's remaining is there's an MP that's uh, on hidden Markov models, which I hope you enjoy doing because it's around uh, how, how we can apply hidden Markov models to like a car which is driving in a, on a highway. And you have to, I think you have to predict the trajectory of the car. Um, from uh, by applying HMMs. So that should be interesting, I, I hope. And the last MP, uh, we are still debating, it could be around dynamic time warping, or we are debating if there's something else that's of, that also could be interesting. Uh, DTW, dynamic time warping is actually quite popular in the industry. So um, that is part of the reason why we thought we'll include it. Um, but if we are thinking if there's something something else that's also interesting that we could include. So you have two MPs left. Um, one paper review, which is backdoor, which you've already seen. And I think that's pretty much it that's left. And there's no final exam. So um, you are almost close to the end. Great. With that, let's get started. Okay. So in many applications, you, you, you will be required to compare two signals, okay? Two time series data, right? So suppose I tell you here is a signal and here is another signal. And I ask you to com compute some similarity between these two signals. What would you do today? Suppose I tell you these are two signals, S1, S2. And I say, and I ask you, are these signals same? Are, are these signals similar? Or I say like, look, S1 is someone speaking hello. It's the acoustic signal of someone speaking hello. And I want to know if S2 is also hello or not. So you want to say, the, so essentially the question is, is S2 the same as S1? And yeah, there are some noise in S2, maybe there's some other differences, but I want you to compute some similarity. How would you compute similarity today? Probably correlation or variance. Right. Correlation is a good way to compute similarity, okay? But correlation sometimes may not be enough. And let's, and today this dynamic time warping is going to talk about where correlation is not adequate and you need something more, okay? So here is a case where, let's look at an example where signal S1 is someone saying Alexa, signal S2 is someone else saying Alexa, but the pronunciation of Alexa for these two signals are different. Meaning the first person says, hey, Alexa, and the second person says, Alexa, right? So the first person says, Alexa. And the second person says, Ale Alexa. Okay. In this situation, the two signals, if you correlate, they may correlate well towards the end, this part, but they may not correlate well to this part, right? So correlation may not work out very well in this case, because this part will affect you significantly. And I can think of other cases where it is, the signals are, you know that the signals are the same words, but they're pronounced in a way that if you take sample by sample, 
the, those sample by sample similarity is not the same, but you know that they're actually the same word. One is delayed, one is compressed and so forth. Okay. So in this case, correlation will not work. Questions, is that clear? Okay. Another example is the following. You know, let's say this is a signal that's coming from an ECG monitor. Okay, ECG is your, uh, uh, your body's vital sign, electrocardiograph, it monitors your heartbeat. And then you have another sensor. Actually, this is true. We, have, we uh, some of my students build an uh, ECG sensor and they kind of uh, pasted, with, pasted it on the, on the human body and they're getting signals that's supposed to be ECG as well. The only problem that happened is that the sensor that my student built, it actually, this cheap ECG sensor drops segments of data periodically. Okay. So if you think of the same, same signal over here, let me just copy this. Okay. That's the same signal, but what this cheap sensor actually does, this is a real life case. What the cheap sensor does is that it drops some packets over here and other places. Okay. But when it drops the when it, it drops samples, but when it drops those samples, because of the buffer management in the circuit, it does not tell you where it dropped those samples. Instead, it takes these other samples, and this is something to pay attention to. It takes these other samples and concat, oops, sorry. Oh, this won't move, I see, this one moves uh, together, hold on. So what it does is it takes these other samples. I'm gonna draw this again, one second. Okay, this blue signal is the sample, is the signal that this cheap ECG monitor would give out. And I hope you saw what I did to that signal. Basically, wherever the signal got dropped, I took the next chunk and I concatenated it. So this cheap sensor does not tell you where it dropped the samples. It drops sometimes and it takes the next set of samples that are coming in and it just concatenates in the buffer and gives you the full buffer. Okay. And this is what it looks like. So for example, it dropped the signal over here. See, this is the rising edge, which is same as this. And this is the falling edge, which is the same as this. So it dropped this part, it dropped this part of the signal, but it just concatenated this part to this part, just short circuited that like that. And it gives you the signal. So then the question is, can we, al can we align, oops, S1 and S2 and identify which segments were dropped? You see, right, this will be very useful if you take the 
cheap census ecg data and do your computation that would be wrong right you need to really separate this oops you need to really separate this part out and move it give it some time the right time shift right you need to separate this part out and give it the right time shift so that this part aligns exactly with this part this part aligns exactly with this part and so forth make sense good another example where again correlation may not work well is the following let's say this is space and this is time you've seen this in hidden markov models similarly kind of similar kind of a representation and let's say this is a trajectory that a cia agent is walking or has walked you have that trajectory okay so the cia agent's trajectory is in black is in is in black yeah now some other person has also been walking and your you are a team you're a you're a um, intelligence team and you have this other person's walking trajectory who walks like this so some other person's trajectory is in red so you get this data your your the cia agent is in your team and the cia agent is in some covert operation somewhere and and you get this data for this from this other person who's who, whose trajectory is in red and your goal is to figure out is this other person following the cia agent okay so you need to really find understand that are these two are these two trajectories similar are they walking along the same similar path even though in time when this guy is walking where the, when the cia agent is walking the other guy might be static right and then when the cia agent is static maybe the cia agent is looking at something in a store this other guy walks right the other guy thinks that you are going to apply correlation to match those trajectories so the other guy is walking in a way so that correlation is going to fail so when the cia guy is static the other guy is walking when the other guy is when the cia gets guy starts walking the other guy stops and sees which way the cia agent is walking so here is another example where now if you correlate these two you can take that trajectory and make it into a signal if you correlate those two signals you're going to really see that it's not going to correlate well is that clear why these two will not correlate well very good can anyone think of any other example where cross correlation won't work any other thoughts i mean you don't have to but in case someone else has any other thought where cross correlation is not going to work that's okay you can think about this at home where think where cross correlation doesn't work in what kind of signals what kind of applications but here are three 
where we are talking about pronunciation, we are talking about a circuit dropping samples and concatenating the subsequent samples and motion trajectories in which someone is trying to not walk in lockstep. Okay, good. So DTW, dynamic time warping is an algorithm that's aimed at figuring out that, oh, actually these, both of these are Alexa or both of these can be aligned with, or the S2 can be aligned with the S1, the true ECG signal, or, oh, these two trajectories are actually the same trajectory. They are, they are, one is following the other, except that things are staggered in time. Okay. So given two signals, S1 and S2, or two time series data, S1 and S2, DTW's output is what is the closest possible match between S1 and S2, and here it's important, by optimally compressing or stretching the substrings, the subsegments. of the signals. Okay. What does that mean? That means when I have Alexa and when I have Alexa, okay, I'm gonna say, look, given these time two time series data, I can see that they're, they're not, the correlation doesn't work well, but if you were to cancel out or compress, like you collapse all of these into one A, as opposed to three A's, you collapse them into one A, as opposed to three L's, you collapse them into one L, then the, how, how well does it actually match? Does that make sense? Because now it's going to match perfectly, right? Because now it's going to be Alexa and Alexa. Although we have two A over here, which, which we canceled off, which we compressed. And we had two L's over here, which we also compressed. Right? So it's basically saying compress both of them in the optimal way, in the best possible way. And then after that, what is the similarity between those compressed signals? Right? So you find me the best matching. And for to find that best matching, whatever compression and subtraction you have to do, do that. So in this case, what you can say is, look, if I take this red, oh, okay, wait, hold on. Let me draw this again. And mm. Yeah. Now let me erase this red one. Now I take this blue one and this is what the blue one looks like. The followers trajectory, which does not correlate well, but if I can somehow align it like this, now look how, how much better it actually aligns. It's not exact. Right? But by shifting things in time, I can see the alignment much better. 
whereas this does not align at all. Okay. So dynamic time warping is allowing this additional degree of freedom. In addition to correlation, you can compress, you can stretch different parts of the signal and then tell me after you do all of that, how well does it align? Okay. And that is actually useful because exactly in these applications such as pronunciation in speech recognition, people would say, I have this template of hello, but different people have different accents. Someone would say hello, right? And you take that hello and you say, actually, this is still hello because if you compress that uh part, then it will match up very nicely. So how do we do this? So let's model this problem for speech recognition. Okay. So what we will do is that we will write signal S1 as columns, as a column, as multiple columns, the samples of signal S1, and the samples of signal S2 as multiple rows. Okay. And now look, if the two signals were identical, then the best alignment comes from going down the diagonal. If the two signals were aligned, absolutely perfect, right? In other words, if they were absolutely perfect, Alexa and Alexa Guys, can guys, guys can, can you still, still, still hear, me? hear me? We can still hear you. Oh, I see. Okay, okay so hold on. I, I got, got signed out from my laptop. One second. I'll, I'll be, be back, back soon. Back. Guys, can you see me? 
Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Could you see me all this while? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's interesting. Okay, things are all good now. Okay, okay. so um, I don't know if the recording got dis uh, discontinued. Now it's recording again. So quickly, just as a quick recap, we are talking about dynamic time warping where correlation is not a good way to compute similarity between two signals because the signals might be expanded or contracted versions of the other, uh, such as in pronunciation of Alexa, such as in ECG monitors where things are segment samples are getting dropped, such as someone following another person. So if you look at the trajectory of the two people, they are not correlatable. But if you move them in time, then you might see a fantastic matching. So we are now saying that, wait. Right. So now we are saying that um, if the two signals S1 and S2, ones that that is um, laid out as columns, the samples of the signals are laid out as columns and the other, the samples are laid out as rows. If the two signals were identical, then the best match would be the signal going along the diagonal. No problem, right? You see that. Now, if the two signals are not identical, then the way we model these compressions is by saying, okay, I'm going to go down this path and then I'm going to go down this path. What does that say? That says that for the same A and A, you have compared them but instead of comparing the next L and A, if I compared this A and this A, which is also similar, that makes me go down this path. Okay, I didn't say that very well. I'm trying to figure out which parts of the two signals should I compress. And compression can be thought of as holding on to one sample of the sig of signal S1, but moving forward with the second sam moving forward with the samples of signal S2. That means I'm compressing S2, right? Whereas if you hold on to one sample of signal S2 and move forward with the signals of with the samples of S1, that means you're compressing signal S2. So I'm trying to map or represent this notion of compression through these paths in the matrix of S1, S2. Tell me if that makes sense. Right? So if I want to compress these two, I go down this, this path, then I don't want to compress anymore. So I move from A to L and I move from A to L. So this is this. And maybe now I want to compress these two. 
So then I should move horizontally, right? And then I don't want to compress any L and E, L and E, I go down this path. And now I again want to compress E and E. So I should go down this path. And then I don't want to compress any E X. I want E X. I want E X. So I go down this path. And then I don't want, I want to compress. Oh, I, and then I don't want to compress any because I want X and A, X and A. So I go down this path. But then I want to compress the two A's. So I go down this path. Right? Does that make sense? Again, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you a rough idea of what a path means. A path means from the path, you can tell which parts of the signals you are actually compressing. Right? Now, so, so you can say vertical motion is compressing the vertical signal. Horizontal motion is compressing the horizontal signal. Now, suppose, okay, let me just say this front, it may not make sense and then we'll clarify it. DTW says that we want to find the least cost route or the least cost path that connects the top left corner to the bottom right corner. So in other words, Think of all the possible paths that exists from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. Right? Each path is essentially holding one of the signal states. Each path is essentially compressing the two signals in different ways. I want you to get that in your, wrap your head around that. For example, let's take this path. What is this doing? It's like the entire, like one Alexa and then the entire next Alexa. So like you're compressing the entire word into one sample of the other one. Correct, exactly, right? So when I go this route, I am saying that I'm going to compare A with A, L, L, E, X, X, A. And then what is this path? This path is says, I'm now going to compare this A with A, A, L, E, E, X, A. So another way of looking at it is correlation, remember, was actually let me draw them in the mm. yeah, let me move make a little space here. Space is not super important. Yeah, so correlation was versus A, let me draw that in a different color. Correlation was saying I'm gonna compare everything that are on top of each other, right? That was correlation. You agree, guys? Now,
this path is saying, this blue path that I just drew, that is saying, Compare this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then compare this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Tell me if that makes sense. I could even make a little more gap over here so that it's clearer. First, you're comparing And then you're comparing, oops. This corresponds to this path. Right? Now, can you tell me what corresponds to this path? This path. First one is I keep A from S1 fixed and I compared them to the two A's. So I keep this fixed. This is this. Agreed? Then what do I do? Then I compare this and this. Right? This diagonal is like I move S1, I also move S2, both by one step. Right? This vertical line said that I am fixing S1's first sample and I'm comparing it to S2's first sample and S2's second sample. So it's this. But the second one, this part, is saying this. What is this saying? Someone? You compare L in S2 with um, L, the second L in S1. Right. Then? Then you yeah. compare the E in both signals. And then, yeah, correct. And then what happens? This one? That's E and E, right? And then what happens? Someone? You compare the next E with S1Z. You compare the next E uh, S2's next E with S1's next, uh, with S1's. Right. Then you do that. This one is this one. Then this one is this one. And then this one, sorry. This one is watch. This one. These are the comparisons you made. And you're saying, look, now if you can some add some cost, 
some cost to each comparison, some cost C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, C8, C9. If you can, correlation was also had, also had some cost to each comparison, right? C1, C2, C3, so on till Cn. What was correlation cost? You multiply the two and you add, and then you add them up. Over here, you can have some other form of cost which says, is A similar to A? Is A similar to this A? How are each of these alphabets or these characters similar or dissimilar to others? And accordingly, you find out what is the total dissimilarity. Okay, guys, so if I zoom out, what we are really saying is each of these paths has a different cost. Okay. If I can find the path that has the least cost from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, what does that least cost path represent? What does that least cost, path, least cost path represent? It represents what is the closest possible match between S1 and S2 after optimally compressing and stretching different subsegments of the signals. Right? So you, it's like saying you, you compress any part of the signal and then if you come up with the best match between S1 and S2. Okay. So how do we define cost for this, for this route? If we can define, if we can define the right cost for the route, then we are done because we essentially want to find the least cost route, the least cost path. So how do we define cost? Well, what we can say is that the cost of a route R, <laughs> excuse me, is the sum of node cost the node at IJ for all IJ belonging to R. Okay. So first thing I'm going to say is, look, the cost of this whole path is basically the sum of these note costs. Okay. Now, what is note cost dij? This is some dissimilarity between ij. So example is dissimilarity between A and A is zero. Dissimilarity between, or let's call it just D. D of A and A is zero. D of A and A is small. You can give some number, but A, 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 small d of you can say d of a and l is large if we are trying to find out we are trying to give some cost to this notion of when i compare when i compare a to a when i compare e to when i compare let's say e to x or sorry or in this case we are comparing we are doing the best one but there could be another route where we are comparing A to L or we are comparing A to X. So we need a cost for each comparison between different possible alphabets. Okay. So let's create this cost matrix where A to A is zero. L to L is zero, E to E is zero, X to X is zero. 
but for a and l a l are very different signals so let's make that 5 that's very dissimilar a and e let's make it small 2 a and x let's make it 3 l and e maybe 3 l and x are more dissimilar 4 e and x maybe 3 so we are putting dissimilarity cost this dissimilarity matrix we are creating one for every pair of character right so when we do these comparisons over here we will know what this cost is. And now we say, this is what the DTW algorithm says. The DTW algorithm says that the cost of CJRJ, CJ means column J, row J, equals the dissimilarity of column J row J plus the minimum of the cost of CJ minus one RJ minus one comma C cost of CJ minus one RJ comma cost of Cj Rj minus one. What is it saying? It is saying that the cost of a path C stands for the cost of a path. Okay, let, let, let's be clear with that. C stands for the cost of a path. CJRJ is some element of the matrix. So this says the cost of the path from the top left corner all the way to CJRJ or the way all the way to element CJ column J row J. So if I say if I say C of 3, 5, this means the cost to arrive at 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it says, what is the cost? What is the cost to arrive at this location? Because this is basically 3, 5. The cost to arrive at this location is the minimum cost of arriving at that location from all different paths that can arrive at that location. Okay, so that's what CJ, C of CJRJ means. That is equal to D of CJRJ. D of CJRJ, now let's say again, take three comma five. This is three comma five. Three comma five. D of 3 comma 5 is says what is the dissimilarity between L and X? Okay, so that is this direct dissimilarity. Okay, so direct dissimilarity plus the cost of the path cost, the minimum path cost up till the previous diagonal node, the previous top node, and the previous side node. Okay. So this is what the DTW algorithm says. And if you keep computing this all the way till the bottom of the right bottom of the matrix, then you have found what is the best matching between the two signals. If none of this made sense, or if you're confused, which I can understand, this example should clarify everything. Okay, so let's do this example where 
we have been given a dissimilarity matrix and we have been given these two signals s1 and s2 and we are supposed to compute what is the best alignment between the two signals okay so let's start so aa is 0 0 okay and here is the algorithm by the way here is the algorithm so you start off with this node 0 0 and that is 0 you know that and now let's compute this one so this one is told to be so that one is essentially um, C of one, two, right? Which is equal to D of one, two plus minimum of minimum. Okay, we will go to that. What is D of one, two? How much is D of one, two guys? Five. Five. Very good. Plus minimum of minimum of C J minus one R C J minus one R J minus one, which is zero comma one zero comma C J minus one, so zero comma one. Yeah, okay. Comma C of zero comma two, comma C of one comma one. Okay. So C of zero comma one is this element. Right? If this is one comma two, this is zero comma one. Right? That doesn't exist. Right? So you don't have to worry about that. C of zero comma two, zero comma two is this element. That also doesn't exist. Okay? And C of one comma one, which is, this is one comma one, right? So you're saying the cost of this node is the dissimilarity between A and L, that this dissimilarity plus the minimum of this value, this value and this value, agreed? Because this value, this value, and this value are coming from this, this, and this. Now, these two don't exist, so it's only this. So the cost of 1, 2 becomes D12 plus 0. Right? So how much is the value of D of C12? It is 5. Right, because D12 is 5 and minimum of those 3 equals 0. So this is 5. And now what DTW says is you remember where your minimum came from. In this case, your minimum came from C11, this C11. So you put an arrow from C11 to your current node. Guys, can you please ask questions if this is unclear? Professor, could I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I'm just uh, sort of like double checking. So the cost, like when we describe cost, that's purely just based on the dissimilarity between, in this case, letters, right? It has nothing to do with 
like cost of calculation or anything like that, right? There are two things over here. One is the dissimilarity, which is character by character direct comparison. And the cost is the cumulative cost to come to that location. Right, okay. But it has nothing to do with like cost of computing power, right? No, 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 not at all. Sorry, okay. not at all, not it's at all. Just not about dissimilarities. There's just dissimilarities, absolutely. Okay, okay, yes. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now, if that makes sense, now tell me how do I compute cost of this one? This one is dij. How much is dij here? This is d13. How much is d13? Five. Five. Plus cost of the minimum cost of this, this, and this. These two don't exist. You can think of them as infinity. So the minimum of these three is five. So what is the value of this? What is the value of cost of, so, so you said it correctly, D13 is five. Let me number them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So D13 is five because that is basically comparing A to L. And A to L over here is five. So what is C13 now? C13 is nothing but D13 plus the minimum of the top diagonal, the previous diagonal, the top and the left, right? And the minimum of that is how much? Five. So how much is C13 then? What is confusing? It's 10, right? It's 10, yeah, exactly. And the arrow comes from here because the minimum of those three neighborhood blocks was the left-hand one, right? Because these two are infinite. So let's keep doing AE, the next block, this one is a E is two. So how much should this be quickly? C of one four equals two. Twelve. Or twelve. C of one four, right? Twelve. C is two, yeah. Then quickly fill up. Fifteen. Fifteen. Then 15 and 15. Very good. Okay. So DTW says, fill out the first row. Okay. Now let's start with the second row. Okay. How much is this? Quickly. What is D? Zero. Yes. This is basically D21. D21 is zero plus minimum of left diagonal, left top, right? So zero plus minimum of left diagonal does not exist, infinity. Left does not exist, infinity. Top is zero. So zero plus zero, that must be zero. Let's do the next one, this one. 
How much? Oh, by the way, for this zero, where should the arrow come from? The previous zero, this zero, we need to put the arrow. Where did the minimum come from? Top. One, one. Correct. So we put the arrow over there. Okay. Now keep doing. Do the second row. What is the, what is two, two? Give me cost of two, two. The cost should be five. The cost should be five because A and L is five. And the minimum of the top left and top left, the minimum of those is zero. So where should the arrow come from? You can bring the arrow from here or you can bring the arrow from here, right? You pick any one, let's pick the diagonal. So you bring the arrow from here, this is five. Next one along the row, two, three, tell me. Ten. Where does the arrow come from? Let's between the diagonal and the left, let's always prioritize diagonal. This is just random. Let's bring the arrow from the diagonal. Next one. Twelve. Twelve. Next one. Sixteen. A and X is three. How much? Sixteen. Fifteen. Fifteen. Good. And then 15 and 15. Then 15 and 15. And where should the arrow come from? All diagonals. We are, we are prioritizing diagonals. Okay, very good. Next, this one, three, one. Now quickly fill up. This is easy, five. Five. This one. Zero. Zero. Where should the arrow come from? Uh, diagonal. Correct. Keep going. Next. A zero comes from left. Then. Three comes from left. Keep going. Uh, seven comes from left. Seven because L and X is four. Four plus three comes from left. Keep going. Twelve comes from left. Very good. And then 17 for, oh yeah, 17 from left. This. Seven comes from top. E and A, A and E is two, two plus five, yeah. Then this one. A three comes from top. Very good. Three comes from top because L and E, L and E are, is three and there's a zero on top. So that's the minimum. So it's three, very good, keep going. Three comes from top again. Keep going. Zero comes from diagonal. Okay, very good. Next. Uh, three comes from left. Then. Uh, five comes from left. And seven from left. Okay. Let me see if I can quickly fill out the rest or unless you want to tell me. AE is, AE is two. So I have two nine. 
Is that right, Eric? Yeah. Nine. Okay. E L is three, so I'm going to take six. Six. Yeah. Do that with me. Then let's do E L again. Six again from top. Six again from top. Zero from top. That's E. Zero from top. E X is. Three from left, uh, from diagonal. Three from diagonal. Um, uh, five from diagonal. And E A is again. It's two and then so seven, okay. Diagonal. Okay. Last two rows, X A and X, three. Uh, three, 12. X and L. Four, that's. 10 from top and then mm -hmm. 10 from top again. Mm -hmm. And then X e is three. Right? Yeah. Yep. X X is zero. Zero. X A is a three. And then so that'd be six. Why? Uh oh no, never mind. Sorry. Right. Bad. Right. And then X A is again three, but I have to make it six. So six. It comes from the left. Okay, we're almost there. Mm -hmm. uh, be twelve from top. Twelve from top. Yeah. Then. And then fifteen from top. Mm -hmm. Fifteen from top again. And then five from top. And then three from top, and then three, and then six. Really? Zero? Oh, oh. sorry. It, so, yeah. It okay. is zero okay. from diagonal. Zero, zero, yeah. Very good. OK. Mm -hmm. So look, we solved DTW. And it tells me that the path, the least cost path, to reach the bottom end, the bottom right, which is the end, right? Which is where I finished comparing S1 to S2. The least cost path is zero. That means the dissimilarity, there's no dissimilarity. And how, what is that least cost path? You just retrace where the arrow came from. That's the path. That's the same one we had before. Right? Exactly, right? Exactly. This is the same one we had before. So that gave you, the DTW algorithm gave you that path. And that path tells you that, look, you have to compress these two. You have to compress these two. Again, you have to compress these two. And that would make the two things align perfectly. Right? So if you took this example of ECG over here, it would have told you that, oh, you know what? There is some place over here that you have to compress. And there's some other place over here you have to compress. And that would have told you where the signal samples were dropped. Okay. Similarly, over here, it would have told you, look, this, this blue trajectory You started like this, right? So you said, look, if you compress this part, which means, which means you are, oops. If you compress that part, that essentially means that you are actually moving this like this. I cannot move the black trajectory now, but Think about it. If I if I compress the 
if I compress this part of the black trajectory, then this part will go here and this part will start from here. And that would match much better with the blue trajectory. So DTW is telling you what is the right path in which you would make the two signals as close to each other as possible. And in this case, it turns out the closest matches, the dissimilarity is zero, meaning it perfectly matches. But in some other cases, it may not match perfectly, but you'd get the best match. Okay. Now, of course, you can add constraints to DTW. You can say, um, this, this path that you have, you can say that, look, this should not go outside this green area because the optimal is this alignment. The optimal is the diagonal line. You can define a green area and say, look, you cannot compress too much because if you go along this path, that means you're compressing everything over here. And you can say, look, you cannot complain, compress that much because there's an upper bound on how much I'll allow you to compress. Right? So you can give these kind of constraints to DTW. So you say, you cannot compress or stretch too many in one shot. The second, the second constraint you can give is no discontinuity. You, you can say, look, your path has to be continuous. You cannot do this and then start from here when you're doing the comparison. Right? There cannot be a discontinuity in your path. And finally, you can also say something like no time reversal. meaning you cannot have a path that goes back in time, right? Look, this is a path where you're moving forward. You're comparing this with these. And suddenly when you came to this, you went back and you compared with this. Sorry, you came to this, this is this and this, and then you moved backwards and you're now comparing this with this. That is not allowed. So you can give many constraints to DTW depending on what your application really needs. But this is a nice general algorithm that allows you to compare two signals by stretching them and, comp and compressing them and figuring out what is, even if you do the best kind of stretching and, uh, uh, stretching and compressing, what is the best match that you can achieve? And this happens to be a pretty efficient algorithm. This is a dynamic program. And DTW is popularly used in many, many applications. Speech being one of them, but uh, like I said earlier, even motion traje trajectory tracking, et cetera, where correlation is not a good idea because correlation does not capture these time dilations in the signal, okay? Oops, I still ended up taking a lot of time. Um, I'll stop here. Questions? Questions? Okay, if no questions, then let's end over here and I'll hang back for any office hour questions. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks guys for coming. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Thank you.